Hello and welcome everybody to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series. We're in summertime, so hopefully you're taking a little time out to go and stop and smell the roses or whatever, whatever other flowers are in your garden. But today we're going to stop and take a closer look at the flowers because one of the most amazing processes in all of nature that makes our lives possible is happening all the time. And we've got David Mizajewski of the National Wildlife Federation to tell us all about it. And so get excited to learn a little bit about pollination. Now, a couple things before we uh, we turn it over to David get, to get us started. One, please keep this really interactive. You'll see the chat box to the right of the screen. This is interactive. David's going to find out what you know about pollinators while we also tell you some things you probably don't know about pollinators. And he wants to find out what you want to know. So answer his questions in the chat there. Also feel free throughout the class to ask him any questions that are on your mind. And in the last 10 minutes, I'll interview David with your questions so we can get you some of those answers about all those pollinators you've always wanted to know. Also have a camera nearby because in about 30 minutes, we're going to give everybody an opportunity to lean into the screen, take a selfie with David and be entered to win a, a membership in Wildlife Creature Club Camp, sorry, not club this summer with Varsity Tutors and a copy of, of David's book about all kinds of backyard creatures, pollinators, and, uh, and all of the above. So have that camera nearby. If you get that up on Instagram, uh, we'll have the official handles up on the way out on a slide so you know exactly who to tag so that you're entered to win. All right, with all that, without further ado, let me turn it over to your teacher for today, David Mizajewski of the National Wildlife Federation. And David, it's your show, man. All right, excellent. I wasn't sure if I was live yet there. So, hey, everybody, thanks for having me. Thanks, Brian, for that great intro. I'm super excited to be back with Varsity Tutors tonight to be talking all about plants and pollinators and basically how plants have very cleverly figured out a way to make animals do their hard work for them. So let's dive right into it. We are going to be talking about a bunch of different topics underneath this category of plants and pollinators. So you're going to see on the screen here some of the different things we're going to talk about. We're going to just go over what pollination is. Then I'm going to introduce you to some of the pollinators. We're going to actually meet some pollinators. Then we're going to dive into bees. I think most of you probably know already that bees are pollinators, um, but we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things you probably don't know about bees. And then we're going to finish with how you can get involved helping the bees and other pollinators. So that's a little overview of, of how this class is gonna go. And as Brian said, we want this to be really interactive. So you all have that chat box, put your questions in there. If I don't get to them, I don't answer them just in, in the course of me speaking today, then we'll get to your questions at the end and we'll do a little Q and A section. But right now, I want everybody to put into your chat what your favorite food is. Because pollination is really, a critical part of our food. So I wanna hear from you all, you know, what kind of foods you like to eat? It can be anything. Okay, we're seeing some, some answers in now. <laughs> Hamburgers, mac and cheese. Okay, I'm finally seeing some vegetables. That's good, apples. Yeah, what kind of foods do you, do you all like to eat? Okay. Ooh, grilled cheese, that's one of my favorites. Cereal. All right, good stuff. Yogurt. Well, did you know that most of the foods that I'm seeing coming up in the chat right now that you were putting in, are we only have them because of pollinators. Pollinators are responsible for one out of every three bites of food we human beings eat. And it's not just the things that, that you know, might be a little bit obvious, that like the, the plant foods, you know? And again, we're gonna talk about exactly what pollination is, but um, you know, plants produce certain foods, you know, berries and fruits and things like that, that are the result of pollination. And I think you know, some of you might already know that, but if you like pizza or if you like hamburgers, you can thank a pollinator for that. Ice cream, tea and coffee, all of those things we have because of pollinators. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that as we, as we get in. But let's, let's start at the, at the bottom here, at the basics. What exactly is pollination? Now, let me know in the chat if you've heard this word before and if you think you have an idea 
about what pollination is. Just a you know, yes or no, if you've heard of po pollination before. I think, yeah, a lot of you guys have heard it. It's not, not a new word. Some of you might have learned it in school. If any adults are watching, you've probably heard it in, in the news, in you know, and gardening magazines and things like that. So this is a really simple, basic overview of what pollination is. So in nature, we have all sorts of different kinds of plants. And today on this planet, many of those plants are what we call flowering plants. And so the plants have evolved to put out these flowers. And we all know what flowers are. You know, they, they are parts of the plant that usually have bright colors and they've got these petals that surround a center part. Now, what you might not know is what is in the center of that flower. Well, it's all the parts that help the flowers uh, basically make seeds so that the plant themselves can reproduce, you know, seeds turn into new plants. And so they're kind of like, you know, kind of like baby plants. But the plants need to move pollen from one plant to another, from one flower to another flower in order to get fertilized so they can make a seed that is fertilized and that will actually grow into a new plant. If a flower does not get fertilized, it cannot form that seed. So it's a really, really important thing to be able to do that. Now, here's the thing. Plants can't walk around and move themselves or move one flower over to another flower on another plant, right? So how do they do it? Well, this is the part where we had a little bit of fun in the description here and the title is about plants tricking animals. So plants can't move themselves, but animals can. So what they have done is these flowering plants have evolved these, these, these structures that we call flowers that offer a reward to certain kinds of animals if they come and visit that flower and move their pollen over to the next flower, again, fertilizing it. That's what we call pollination. And what's the reward? Well, the reward is flower nectar. Now, do you all like drinking sodas or lemonade or other sweet drinks? Yeah, I think probably a lot of you do. Well, those sweet, those, those drinks that, that we like to drink that are treats are, are sugary. They're, they're sweet. And pretty much all animals like the taste of sugar. So so that's what is in flower nectar. Flower nectar essentially is just sugar water and the plant produces it and sugar of course is high in calories and that's what these animals wanna come and eat. So they visit the flower, they come and they, they just think they're coming to get a meal, get a nice sugary drink to keep their energy levels going. But in the process, the plant, and if you look at that first picture there all the way over to the left, in this case, it's a bee visiting a flower. It comes in to get the nectar that's down in the middle part and if you go over to number two there, those little, um, those little knobs on the end of those little stalks around the middle part, that's called the anther, and that has the pollen on it. It brushes all over that bee or other animal that has come to drink the flower nectar. And after the, the, the animal gets its fill and drinks the little bit of nectar that that one particular flower offers, it flies on to the next flower. And when it does, some of the pollen that got dusted on its body from the first flower sticks to the stigma. And that's another part of the flower that takes the pollen in and brings it down into the flower where it, fer it, gets, it fertilizes that flower. And that's when the flower can begin to form seeds. So plants are very, very clever. They figured out how to get over the fact that they themselves can't move at least flowering plants. Now there are other plants that do this without pollinators. They use the wind and they have very fine pollen grains that blow in the wind and get from you know, one plant to the next. Those, by the way, happen to be the plants that cause some of our seasonal allergies. So if you get hay fever or seasonal allergies where your eyes and nose itch, usually it's the wind pollinated plants, not the animal pollinated plants, which are the ones with the big showy flowers. Another way that the flowers attract their, their animal pollinators is not just with the reward of food in the form of nectar, but some of them have really cool bright colors that again are a lure. And for some of these pollinators like bees, they can see a spectrum of colors that we all can't see as human beings. So if you look at certain flowers with say ultraviolet light on them, you see that they look like bullseyes and it makes it really easy for those pollinators to come and find them. So that's just a little bit about what pollination actually is. So I think probably some of you knew some of that, but maybe not all of it. So what does that mean? Why, are po why is pollination important? Well, we've already talked about it. Without pollination, we would not have many of the foods that we eat that we rely on to be healthy as human beings. So many of the 
fruits and seeds and nuts and things like that, that we human beings eat come as a result of animal pollinators. And I'm just gonna read you just a few. If you like to eat blueberries, apples, avocados, cherries, cranberries, peaches, uh, pumpkins, tomatoes, squash, some of the plants that we grow in our vegetable gardens, they're pollinated by animal pollinators. And without those pollinators, those plants would not be able to make all those delicious foods. And like I mentioned a minute ago, they're even responsible for pollinating the plants that make the beans that people turn into coffee and the leaves that we turn into tea. So if there's anybody out there that's a coffee or tea drinker, you can thank a pollinator for that. And I mentioned earlier too about ice cream and cheese and, and that hamburger or a steak. Well, that's because th those foods are also the, the work of pollinators, not directly, you can't pollinate a cow, but we pollinate, the, those pollinators are pollinating the alfalfa that we end up feeding to our dairy and beef cattle. And without those animals, we wouldn't have, again, the hamburger or the cheese for our pizza or the yogurt or the ice cream. So pollinators are really, really important for us in producing our food. Again, one in three bites of our food comes as a result of animal pollinators. But the other reason that these pollinators and pollination is so important is that we're not the only animals that live on this planet that need to eat. So all of the wildlife out there, they also rely on their fellow wildlife, these pollinating animals, to produce the seeds and the berries and the nuts and the fruits that they eat. And then that forms the bottom of the food web. And then other animals eat, you know, bigger animals eat smaller animals and so on and so forth. But what it means is that without all of those pollinators out there pollinating these plants, you know, life on this planet would be very, very different. And you can see these cedar waxwings here, they're eating um, winterberry holly berries there. And, and they're, again, the result of pollinators. So that's what pollination is and why pollinators are so important. So I wanna ask another question. So now that you know that, now that you know how pollination works and, and you know, the food that it produces, what would you think you know, what would be different on this planet if there were no pollinators? What do you think would be missing? Put your answers in the chat. I'll give you a second. Yeah, I mean, you're right. There wouldn't be any of those foods that I just mentioned. And not only would that be sad because many of those foods are really delicious, you know, it would be a real problem because we human beings wouldn't have enough food to eat. And I'm looking for, yeah, okay. so. You, some of you are, are, are saying, you know, the birds wouldn't have anything to eat. Absolutely. So again, like I was just saying, a lot of animals eat those foods directly, the berries and the seeds and the nuts that are found out in nature, like birds um, and many, many other animals. But think about this. One reason, one thing that would happen if pollinators disappeared is that all of those flowering plants would no longer be able to reproduce. And therefore, there would be no new plants. And plants live a long time, many of them, trees, for example, but eventually they die too. They get old and die and they need to be replaced by new young trees. And so it, without pollinators, not only would our food production, both our human food production, but also all the food resources that all the other species and nature need to survive, but the very plants themselves would start to disappear. It's that important. And, and, and life on this planet has been dependent upon pollinators for a long time. The first flowering plants and their animal pollinators really started showing up on this planet during the ages of the dinosaurs. So it's been a long time that this has been kind of the way of life here on this earth. That's over 65 million years. And so, so pollination, it's an important part of, of just life on this planet. So let's move on to, well, let's summarize here. So pollinators, how does it work? They visit plants, they drink nectar, and they also eat some of that pollen in some cases. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And in doing so, they spread the pollen from one flower to another, fertilizing it, allowing the plants to form the seeds that are the next generation of plants. And also all the foods that, you know, the seeds are basically packaged. I didn't say this before. The seeds are packaged oftentimes in those fruits and berries and nuts and things. And that's another way that plants use animals because a whole different set of animals will come and eat those fruits and berries with the seeds inside of them, like those birds, like those mammals, like those uh, reptiles and amphibians and not amphibians, reptiles, uh, turtles and things, and even some lizards, they'll come and eat those fruits and they pass those seeds and the fruit through their digestive tract and the seeds survive that. 
the animal gets the benefit of all the nutrients from the fleshy part of the fruit. And then guess what happens? The animal that has eaten that poops the berry or poops the seeds out. And the poop itself is kind of a fertilizer and it allows that seed to sprout and grow healthy and strong. So it's a double whammy that these plants do on, on animals. First, they use them for pollination and fertilizing their flowers so they can make the seeds. And then they get a different batch of animals to come eat the fruits and spread their seeds far away from the parent plant. So even though plants don't have a brain the way that human beings do and most animals do, they're pretty clever, I think. So let's head on to meeting some of these pollinators. I wanna introduce you to some of these really cool animals that are responsible for pollination. So I want you though to tell me what animals do you think are pollinators? And bees are the obvious one, right? You can see a couple different kinds of bees here on the screen and I've already kind of given away that bees are pollinators and you probably already knew that. So what other animals do you think are pollinators? Yeah, some of you are putting birds in, butterflies, yep. Butterflies are pollinators. We're going to talk about them. Uh, yeah, insects. Not too many, not too many furry animals are, but um, you know, no dogs or cats or any of those answers. But um, but I'm going to tell you about some some furry animals, at least one kind or one group of animals that are, are actually pollinators that are not bees. So why don't we get into it? Let's meet the pollinators. Again, no surprises here. Bees are pollinators. We've been talking a lot about them already. Um, bees that you're probably familiar with, at least some kinds of bees. We're gonna talk a lot more about all the different kinds of bees in a moment. But not only are bees pollinators, but another group of insects are pollinators. Wasps, yes. Wasps that you're terrified of, that you think are gonna come after you and sting you, and that they're just out there to you know, terrify you. Wasps are pollinators, just like bees. In fact, bees evolved from wasps. First, there were only wasps. And then one group of wasps basically became vegetarian um, in that wasps, in addition to drinking flower nectar and acting as pollinators, most wasp species are also predators. So they're flying around eating other insects, by the way, which are many of which are pests. So they're helping in that way. But this one group of wasps eventually you know, stopped eating other insects and only specialized in drinking flower nectar and eating pollen. And those became the bees. So bees are pollinators, wasps are pollinators. And then let's go to our next pollinator. Flies are pollinators. Now there's thousands of different species of flies out there and not all of them are pollinators, but there are many that are. In fact, there's a whole group of flies called flower flies. Um, another name for them is surfid, surfid flies. And you're looking at one of them right here. Now, if you look at it, it does kind of have a similar black and yellow pattern that we see in some bees and wasps. And these flies, again, through evolution, have very cleverly disguised themselves as these other kinds of insects, which of course can sting. And so it's a way of basically tricking would-be predators or anybody that wants to mess with this fly when it's at the flower to kind of leave it alone because it, you know another animal might be afraid of getting stung, but the fly can't sting at all. Um, and so I'll give you a couple tips on how to tell the difference between a, a fly and a bee. So, cause again, they sometimes look alike. If you look at this fly, look at where, how its eyes are positioned on its head. You see how big they are and how they connect at the very top of the head. T pay attention to that for a second and then look at the number of wings on this fly. It's got two wings. Um, can we rewind and go back um, a, a slide or two um, just to compare the, the fly here to, okay, so we can look at the wasp or the bee. Or let's look at this bee right here. So you'll notice that the bee's eyes are a little bit smaller and they're on the side of its head. They don't touch at the top of the head the way that the fly's eyes did. So that's a really quick and easy way to tell the difference between a bee and a fly. And it's really not apparent on this fo photo because the wings are overlapping, but bees have two sets of wings um, and the flies only have one set. So that's another way that you can tell them apart. Their bodies are also shaped very differently. The flies generally have a much bigger head in relation to their body size than the bees do, but, um, but just a few tips on how to tell the difference between bees, wasps, and flies. And if you just you know, were paying attention there, just even in these pictures, you can see some of those differences. But there's more animals that are pollinators. So let's go to the next one. Yes, folks, 
it is true that mosquitoes are pollinators. Now, I am under no delusion that I'm gonna convince you to love mosquitoes and wanna save them and protect them. And the good news is that there are no plants that are really super dependent upon uh, mosquitoes as their pollinators. But I, you know, I think it's important to really fully understand the real ecological role and the importance that even animals that annoy us and that you know, are potentially dangerous to us, because sometimes mosquitoes can spread disease, I think it's important to really know what their value is on, you know, as part of life on this planet. Doesn't mean you have to love them, doesn't mean we have to, you know, not want to shoo them away or get rid of them, but, but here's how it works. So, um, so mosquitoes are, 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 they're actually a kind of fly. They're part of the bigger fly family. That's why I followed um, with, you know, the, the other slide about flies with this mosquito one. But here's the thing. It's only the female mosquito that tries to bite you and get a little drink of your blood. And the only reason she does that is that after she mates, she needs the protein in your blood to help her produce her eggs so that she can lay them and she can keep her next generation going. The male mosquitoes never drink any blood. And when the female isn't, isn't drinking blood to lay eggs, she and the male mosquitoes drink flower nectar just like a bee, just like a wasp, just like many other fly species. And in doing so, they do serve as minor pollinators. And there are a couple plants, there are some orchids that we have right here in North America that are largely pollinated just by mosquitoes. But again, that doesn't mean you have to encourage mosquitoes around your house. Definitely you wanna discourage them, wear your insect repellent. But again, the more you know. Um, all right, so let's move on to our next pollinator. Beetles and bugs are pollinators, at least some of them. Again, just like with bees, just like with wasps, just like with flies, there's thousands of different species of beetles and bugs. And yes, I'm using bugs very specifically because we tend to use the word bug in a very general way to mean any kind of creepy crawly, any kind of arthropod, any kind of insect, and that's okay to do. But in reality, scientifically speaking, there is a whole order of insects known as the bugs. They are the true bugs and they look kind of like the beetles. Um, and you know, that's another whole order of insects. The, the bees and wasps and ants are another order and so on and so forth. So, um, so things like stink bugs are part of the bug family. Cicadas are part of the bug family. Um, and so there are a bunch of different bug species that are flower feeders and they act as pollinators. And there are many beetle species here. And you can see the, the beetle right in the middle of that pink flower, which by the way is a wild rose. Um, you can see it's got those really long antenna. Uh, many of these uh, longhorn beetles or long antenna beetles or flower beetles are pollinators. So be on the lookout for them because there's a lot of cool ones out there. All right, next pollinator are ants. Now ants are not major pollinators. In fact, most ants are not pollinators, but there are a few species out there that we have learned do act as minor, minor pollinators. So I figured I would throw them in there as well. So bees, wasps, flies, including mosquitoes, beetles, bugs, some ants. Who's next? Butterflies. Yeah, we already mentioned this and a lot of you guessed butterflies. Yeah, so butterflies, you know, they drink flower nectar. And in doing so, just like those bees and those other insects, they get dusted with pollen, they move it to the next flower and, and bam, the flower is pollinated. So butterflies are pollinators. And not surprisingly, so are moths. So I wanna just give a little shout out to moths because it is National Moth Week this week. It's a week out of the year that all of us nature geeks celebrate moths and they need a little week of their own because butterflies hog up all of the attention of beautiful insects that are flying around our flowers, right? Everybody loves butterflies and not a lot of people love moths. And we think, oh, they're kind of ugly and they're drab and they fly at night. And that's true for a lot of species. That doesn't mean they're not important, but some moths are really beautiful to look at, as beautiful as butterflies, like this hummingbird clearwing moth, which happens to fly during the day. And remember when I was telling you about how bees evolved from wasps? Well, it's the same thing with butterflies and moths. You can kind of think as butterflies as a group of moths that evolved to fly during the daytime. Um, and so they're, they're, they're closely related, but there are many more moth species. And that makes them actually more important as pollinators, just because there's more of them. So moths are pollinators. Let's go on to our next one. So that covers the insects. So again, uh, bees, wasps, flies, including mosquitoes, bugs, beetles, ants to a very, very minor degree, uh, and then butterflies and moths. Those are some of the main groups of insects that are pollinators. They're the main pollinating animals that we have here in the United States and Canada. But there are some other animals that do act as pollinators, 
like hummingbirds. And again, I love this example. I love this photo because it really shows how plants and their pollinators fit together like two pieces of a puzzle. So if you look at that hummingbird, hummingbirds have those really long beaks, right? And many of the flowers that need hummingbirds to pollinate them have long tubular shaped flowers. And that those two things kind of evolved in tandem right alongside each other. And so the flower puts its nectar at the very bottom at the, at the base of that flower. So the hummingbird has to stick its whole head right into the flower. And then you can see those little stalks coming out of the flower. Well, those are the anthers. And what, what do the anthers do? They deliver the pollen to the body of the pollinating animal. And then when that hummingbird goes on to the next flower on the next plant, some of that pollen will stick to the stigma of that other flower and, and pollinate it. So hummingbirds are pollinators. There are some other birds, orioles, uh, are nectar feeders, and they tend to be pollinators, um, not so much of plants that we have here in North America, but plants in South America are, are often pollinated by, by the Orioles. So there are some birds that are pollinators. And I promised you some furry critters. So let's go to our next pollinator. Yes, bats are pollinators, at least some of them. Now bats, again, are incredibly diverse. There's like 1400 species of bats. They're the only truly flying mammals that we have on this planet. Most bat species, including most of the ones that we have here in North America, are insect eaters. In the US, we have, I think, 47 species of bats, and all but two of them, maybe three, um, are, are insect eaters. And so they're really important. They provide that pest control service, but some of them are nectar feeders. And you can see one of them here. The lesser long-nosed and the Mexican long-tongued bat are two of these nectar feeding bats that do come up and they range as far north as parts of um, Arizona, New Mexico, Southern California, maybe even West Texas. So if you live in those areas, you might even get lucky and see these bats. They feed on flowers of cactus and other, um, other desert plants like agave and things like that. And with, you know, those flowers generally bloom at night and that makes sense because the bats are nocturnal. And it's the same thing. They either have a long nose or a long tongue and they stick it into the flower. They get dusted with pollen all over their furry bodies. They pollinate the plant and on they go. Bananas, um, I think avocados, agave, is all, those are all things that are pollinated by bats. So um, particularly with the agave, you know, if you like agave nectar, that's a nice sweetener. And if there's any grownups out there that enjoy margaritas, the key ingredient in a margarita comes from agave. So you can thank a bat for that margarita uh, at your next happy hour. So let's go on to our next pollinator. Oh, that's it. That's it for the North American pollinators. Um, there are other pollinating animals on this planet. Uh, if you go to um, Australia, there are some possum species that are pollinators. Here in the Americas, a related group of animals, the opossums, we have some recent science that's been done at a species in South America that has been confirmed to be a pollinator. There are some lizards on islands, some geckos that actually act as pollinators, and there's probably a bunch of others that um, you know, are yet to be discovered. But here in North America, the main pollinators are mostly the insects that we just mentioned, along with the hummingbirds and a few of the bat species. So, um, and you'll see here on that, that, that slide that we just jumped off of, I just wanna give a shout out because, because many of them are insects and because some of them can sting, you know, we tend to think of them as pests or scary, but I hope just by listening to what we've covered so far that you'll have a little bit more of an appreciation for these animals and understand that they're just doing what they need to do to survive. And that role that they're playing in the environment, in the ecosystem is really, really important, not just for you know, all of the wildlife species and the wild plants and the you know, kind of the health of the environment, but for us too, a lot of our food comes from these pollinators and a lot of the things that, that you know, sort of keep our planet healthy are the result of these pollinators. So try not to be scared of them. You know, practice the golden rule, never try to touch them or pick them up or swat at them or get close to them. And, you know, you're not going to have any trouble with them. All right. So let's, though, get down to brass tacks. Of all of those pollinators, there is one that is probably a little bit more important than the others, and that is the bees. And that's just because there's, you know, because of the diversity of bee species and their specific bodily adaptations, um, they are, they are probably the, 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 the puzzle pieces that fit the best with the, you know, the most of the flowering plants that are out there. So as a result of that, um, they just, you know, they're, they're, they're our key pollinators. 
pollinators. And even though the other pollinators are important, bees are probably responsible for more, um, just you know, more of a, of, a, of a percentage of the pollination that's happening out, happening out there than some of the other animals. So now I wanna have a little bit of fun with you guys. Um, and like I was saying, there's a lot of different species of bees. And this is my little quiz that we're gonna take right now. So put on your thinking cap, because I'm about to ask you a whole series of questions. Getting at this idea about, you know, what actually is a bee? And I'm pretty sure that after you take this quiz, you're gonna realize that everything you thought you knew for sure about bees is wrong. <laughs> at least, you know, tongue in cheek. So let's go on to our first question. So again, get ready to put your answer in the chat. True or false? Bees, all bees have black and yellow stripes or some combination of, you know, yellowish and black. Put your answers in the chat, okay? Seeing some yeses, I'm seeing, or I'm seeing some trues, I'm seeing some falses. Well, the answer is, false. <laughs> Now it's true, a lot of bees do have that black and yellow pattern or shades of yellowish, you know, orange and whatnot. But the reality is, is that bees come in a diversity of colors. There are 20,000 different species of bees that we know of on this planet. And a whole bunch of them are not black and yellow. They look nothing like what you would think a bee looks like. And these are just a few examples. Bees come in bright green colors, bright blue. A lot of them are metallic, like the green and the gold bee that you see here. Some of them are furry, some of them are red, some of them are black. So they come in a whole wide range of colors. They're not just black and yellow. So let's go to our next quiz question. True or false? Bees live in hives and have a queen. I think everyone's familiar with, you know, what a queen bee is. She's the, the, the one bee that lays eggs and then those eggs hatch and they become the worker bees. The worker bees feed the queen and the queen lays more eggs and they take care of the eggs and they're the bees that go out and gather the nectar and pollen and make the hive happy and healthy, right? So true or false, all the you know, bees live in hives and have queens. Let's go to the answer. The answer is false. <laughs> so most of those 20,000 bee species that we have on this planet, and which, by the way, we've got about 4,000 of them here in North America, 4,000 different bee species here in North America. Most of them, 90% of them, do not live in hives or have queens. That's because most of our bee species are what we call solitary. So they don't live communally. And it's one individual bee, one individual female bee. She makes a little nesting tunnel either in the ground or in the stem of a plant. Uh, like a hollowed out plant stem, or maybe even um, a, a piece of a dead log or a dead tree or something where a termite has crawled in and made a little tunnel. The, the solitary bees, the females will make little nesting chambers and she'll lay one egg, give it a little ball of nectar and pollen and put seal a little chamber wall there. And she'll fill that tunnel with a whole series of eggs. And then she leaves, she doesn't take care of them. She doesn't feed them. She doesn't have sisters that help her out. She's not a queen. So most bee species, most of the 20,000 bee species, 90% of them do not live in hives and they do not have queens. So let's go to our next quiz question. This is the everything you think you know about bees is wrong <laughs> quiz, fun quiz. Um, and I, I wanna give a shout out again to, as we're taking the quiz, if you have a question, go ahead and put that in the chat now. And um, hopefully I'll answer it during the course of the rest of the talk. We're a little bit more than halfway done here. But if I don't get to it, in my talk, we'll get to in the Q&A section at the end. All right, so true or false? Bees make honey. I think everyone knows the answer to this one, right? True or false? Bees make honey. Put your answers in the chat. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, bees make honey, right? Well, let's see the answer. False. <laughs> now, again, some bees do make honey, but like I was just saying in terms of the hive and the queens, 90% of our bees are solitary. And it's only the, the, the social bees that live in hives and have queens that make honey. So why do bees make honey? Real quick, bees make honey 
to feed the hive and to feed the queen. So if you're a kind of bee that doesn't have a queen and doesn't have a hive, you don't need to make honey, right? So most of these bee species just don't do it because they, there's no reason to. Again, the solitary bees, they gather nectar and they mix it with pollen and they roll it into a little ball and that's what they lay their egg on and that's what their baby eats when it hatches and eventually it will pupate and, and climb out of that little nesting chamber and it'll start the whole process over. So there's no need for honey. So most of the 20,000 bee species on this planet don't make honey. I hope you're learning a lot about bees because I know when I learned all of this, I, my mind was kind of blown. All right, next question, true or false, bees sting. Now, I know some of you have been stung by bees, so I think you're gonna know the answer to this. Put, the, put your answers in the chat. If you've ever been stung by a bee, let us know. We'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. All, or bees sting, true or false? I see a good number of you have been stung by bees. Some of you are allergic to bee stings, um, and that's an important thing to, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. All right, let's see the answer. False, mostly. Now, again, for those of you who have been stung, you know that bees can sting. And here's, here's, here's a little bit about stinging. Bee, all female bees can sting. And that's because the stinger is a special part of the body that is only found on the females. It's actually a modified organ called an ovipositor that in other insects, they just use it to lay eggs. But in bees, in the female bees, it's evolved into, be, into this stinger. And of course they use that stinger defensively to protect themselves from you know, something that might wanna hurt them. And in the case of some of these social bees that do live in hives, they use it to protect their hives. Same thing with wasps. And so that, so all female bees can sting, but almost never do most of these bee species sting. And again, going back to everything we've just been talking about, about all of those, you know, 90% of the 20,000 bee species that are solitary, they don't have a hive to protect. So they are very, very, very unlikely to sting you unless you go up and mess with them. And so here's my, my tip for not getting stung by bees. And this is the golden rule that I think I mentioned a minute ago. And that is just this. If you never try to touch, pick up, pet, poke, prod, mess with, swat at, squish, or any of those things to a bee or another animal, your chances of making that animal feel threatened and it wanting to act defensively, and in the case of bees, that means stinging, you know, your chances of that, if you just leave them alone and just stand back and enjoy them and watch them, are pretty low. You know, yeah, sometimes accidents do happen. Sometimes you might stumble upon a nest. And so you just want to be aware of your surroundings. But, you know, for the most part, it's okay to have bees around, even if you're allergic. And I have to tell you, I'm allergic to wasp stings, and I have to carry an EpiPen just in case I do get stung and have a bad allergic reaction. But I respect bees and wasps, and I kind of let them do their thing, and I don't mess with them. And, you know, I feel pretty comfortable being around them. Um, so just try to keep that in mind. All right, let's go on to our next question. All, a true or false, bees visit all kinds of flowers. You know, we talked about flowering plants and how you know, different flowering plants have different shaped flowers and different color flowers, but true or false, bees can visit all of those flowers and get a drink of nectar and gather pollen. What do you think? Put your answer in the chat. Okay. Seeing some trues and some falses, a good mix, like with all the questions. So the answer is false. There are some bee species that we call generalists that are able to visit all sorts of different kinds of flowers and you know, be able to drink their pollen and gather their nectar. But, and this is kind of emerging science, I would say in the last you know, couple decades, we've really, you know, scientists have really been learning more about these bee species that we call pollen specialists. And so these are bee species that can only gather the pollen from certain plants that are native to their, the region where these bees are found. And these are the plants that the bees co-evolved with, again, over the course of thousands or millions of years. And they really are like two pieces of a puzzle. And so if you don't have the native plant community, the natural plants that grow in any different region and any different environment, 
in North America, we estimate between 30 and 60% of the bee species that are out there, those 4,000 bee species that we have on this continent, that they won't be able to survive unless they have those specific plants. They can't just go to any old plant the way that the general bee species can. And that's a good amount of the bee species, 30 to 60%. So again, the connection between plants and animals, again, it's like a puzzle piece and you can really, one really can't survive without the other. All right, next question. Oh, that is the end of my question. So, um, so again, I hope you had a little bit of fun with that about the whole idea of everything you think you know about bees is wrong. The reason I say that is just because what we, the bee species that most of us know about is the honeybee. And honeybees are great. They are really, really important. They help pollinate a lot of our crops. Um, but here's the thing about honeybees, at least here in North America, they're really not wildlife. They're not wild animals. So for me, I, you know, my organization, the National Wildlife Federation, we focus on, you know, protecting and restoring and teaching people about wild animals. And here in North America, honeybees, they were actually brought over during the European colonization of North America. Um, and that's because honeybees are really a domesticated species. They're kind of like a chicken or a cow. They're really not wild animals or your pet dog, right? And so they're really important. They're helpful, helpful to us. They provide us with honey and they make you know, beeswax, which were two important things for the, you know, the European colonists when they came to North America. Um, they obviously, they also pollinate food crops and things like that. And so they remain really, really important for our agricultural systems and for pollinating our food crops to this day. But as I've already mentioned, globally, there's 20,000 different species of bees. And in North America, we have 4,000 of them. And most people don't know anything about any of those other bee species because the honeybee kind of hogs up all of the attention. So I'm hoping that by taking this class tonight, you've learned a little bit about just the, the fact that there, there's so much diversity of bees right here in, in, in our, on our own continent, but also globally, and that many of them are completely different than the honeybee. Honeybees really are the exception to the rule when it comes to bees. So those statements of, you know, bees don't live in hives, bees don't have queens, bees don't make honey, bees don't, are not black and yellow, bees don't sting, bees can visit any flower. Most of those things are not true for the vast majority of bee species. And I'll say this too, you've probably seen a lot of these wild native bee species flying around right in your own yard, right in your own neighborhood. You just didn't know that they were bees because you were expecting them to be black and yellow or you know, to be flying out of a hive. So my challenge for you is to go outside you know, tomorrow when it's light out, um, maybe this weekend or whatever, and look for some of these different bees. And I guarantee you, if you go somewhere where there's blooming plants, you're gonna see some of them. So let's finish up here with just some practical information on what you can do to help pollinators. So why do we need to help pollinators? Well, the sad fact is that a lot of pollinators are starting to disappear. We human beings, you know, we do a lot of things um, that, that kind of destroy the habitat of a lot of our fellow species. So, you know, when we put in roads and we build housing developments and things like that, um, you know, we take away some of the habitat for bees. And then, you know, sometimes we're doing pollution and we're polluting the air and the water and that can actually kill some of these pollinators and ruin their habitat. So it's a good thing to wanna to help out the pollinators. And remember, pollinators help us. They're really, really important to our way of life and for the life of, of all life on this planet. So what can you do to help pollinators? Pretty simple, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's go to our first thing that you can do to help pollinators. It's as simple as planting flowers. Everybody loves flowers. Flowers are awesome, they're super cool, they're pretty, they smell good, and they're gonna provide food for, for pollinators. All of those pollinating animals that we just talked about need some kind of flower as a main food source. So it's as simple as planting lots of flowers. Next slide. And remember what I was saying about the connection between our native plants that grow out in nature and our, our bees in particular. Um, they need each other. You can't just plant any old plant so if you plant lots and different, lots of different native plants, um, and there's lots of resources out there to help you. The National Wildlife Federation actually has a really great native plant finder. We just kicked off a native plant program where you can get plants directly from us shipped right to your door that will help out these pollen specialist bees. So um, that's something, you know, Google, you can find that native plant collection. And you want to also plant so plant a diversity of things that bloom in all different seasons. So plant some things that are early bloomers in the spring, 
then plant some things that bloom in the middle of the summer, like right now, and also include some things that are gonna bloom in the late summer into the fall, like this aster. This is an aster uh, that I have, I had in my old backyard um, in Washington, DC, and it was covered in bees in you know, late August into September and even early October. So you wanna provide at least three seasons of blooms to provide all sorts of food for all of these great pollinators. All right, what else can we do to help pollinators? Plant caterpillar host plants. So butterflies and moths start out life as caterpillars. And unlike the adults that fly around and drink flower nectar, the caterpillars have to eat the leaves of plants. And just like with those specialist bees that can only feed on the pollen of certain plant species, it's the same thing with butterfly and moth caterpillars. And that's because plants don't like their leaves to get eaten. So they develop poisons in their leaves. And that means that most insects can't eat their leaves. But what butterflies and moths have done have developed an immunity to some of those poisons. Now, they can't be immune to every single plant poison. So they specialize and they are immune to just a small number of plant poisons, right? And that those plants are the only plants those caterpillars can feed on. And we call them caterpillar host plants. Again, there's a lot of great resources out there. You can do a little bit of research on your own. Um, you know, adults, you, you guys can Google this stuff. You can get great plant lists from the National Wildlife Federation of some of the really great pollinator or, or butterfly and moth caterpillar host plants. This happens to be a monarch butterfly. They only eat milkweed. That's a great one to plant because not only is it gonna be a food source for the monarch butterfly caterpillar is the only food source for them, but the flowers are also a great nectar source for all sorts of other pollinators. All right, moving on. When it comes to helping out pollinators, if you see bees nesting in the ground, let them be. Don't squish them, don't try to spray pesticides on them. Now, the difference between a ground nesting bee and say a ground nesting wasp, that is a social wasp, like a yellow jacket, which can be a little bit aggressive and probably you don't want around, um, is that you're only gonna see one bee flying in and out of the tunnel and there won't be a lot of them around. So if you see a hole in the ground and you see lots of black and yellow insects coming and going, that's almost certainly a wasp nest and you want to stay away from that if it's close to your back door or your or your you know your back patio or whatever you might want to call somebody in to come and get rid of that but if you just see an animal like this individual female bee going into a tunnel in the ground or into a again a hollow log or something like that just let it be and don't get too close to her let her do her business and that'll be really a great thing to do to help out these pollinators next Make sure that you leave your plant stems in place. So the, again, this is a picture of one of my old gardens um, in Virginia. And when these flowers stopped blooming and the weather got cold, you know, a lot of times people cut everything down to the ground. But I would leave them standing, not only because after the bees and the other pollinators came and pollinated those flowers, the flowers formed seed heads. And those seeds then became an important food source in the fall and the winter for birds who would then spread the seeds around and we'll get more of these plants everywhere. But inside of those hollowed out dead plant stems is where a lot of these native bees have laid their eggs and made their little nesting chambers and they were filled with baby bees. So the best thing to do is leave these plant stems up all the way into the spring, leave them at least a foot tall. And that way, you know, some of them will have the baby bees in them that will be able to replenish the population the next spring. And pretty soon in the springtime, when the leaves start growing, those dead stems get covered up and you won't even see them anymore. All right, next slide. Again, you can leave a dead log out um, in your yard. If you have a dead standing tree, that isn't gonna be a danger to fall on your house or something. Uh, you know, keep that because that's a great nesting spot, again, for a lot of these native tunnel nesting bees that burrow into dead and dying wood. Next slide. There's just a few more things. You can build an insect hotel. There are lots of great uh, plans for this. In fact, I talk about these in my book, um, Attracting Birds, Butterflies, and Other Backyard Wildlife. We're gonna flash that up in the screen in a few minutes. Great project to do. Um, you know, you can build these things and they just create all sorts of little nooks and crannies for native bees to hide out in and lay eggs in. Um, you can put out an insect hotel, a butterfly house, and you know, butterfly houses don't really attract butterflies per se, but any little critter might go in there and get some shelter. And that's a good thing. Next slide. For hummingbirds, which are pollinators, they nest in trees and shrubs. So plant more trees and shrubs, plant native ones that bloom and you'll be doing a double whammy or you'll be providing a food source for those insect pollinators and maybe even the hummingbirds themselves, and you'll be giving them a spot to nest. Next slide. You can put feeders out for hummingbirds. That'll supplement 
all of those great blooming plants that have the flowers that are the main source of food for hummingbirds. Next slide. You can offer water um, and, and you know, insects need to drink too. You can see these honeybees coming down and you can see their little tongues coming out and sucking up water. But with a water source for pollinators, for insects, you wanna just put some rocks in it, which give them a little place to land. And that's because as insects, they can fall easily into a deeper body of water and drown. So they don't like that. They wanna be able to be somewhere where if they do fall in, they can climb out easily. So that's just a little tip, you know, put out a bird bath, fill it with some rocks, and then fill it with water. And you just dump it out every couple of days so that if mosquitoes are laying eggs in there, you're washing away all of the mosquitoes, which take about a week to emerge as the winged adults, the females of which might try to bite you. All right, next slide. You can even put out mud, a bowl of mud. And again, this is from my own backyard. Mud is a really important building material for our native pollinators, for the native bees, the solitary bees. That's what they use to build the little chamber walls in their nesting tunnel. So put out a little bowl of mud and you might just get some of these native bees coming in to gather it. And by the way, mud is also used by birds like robins and phoebes to build their nest too. So mud is a really great resource. A mud puddle is also something that pollinators will use. In fact, these butterflies are doing something called puddling where they come and they drink up the liquid in the mud which not only is liquid, it's water, but it has dissolved minerals in it and vitamins that they need to survive. So it's kind of just take, like taking a multivitamin, which some of you probably do. It's just in the form of muddy water for butterflies. So just a muddy patch in your yard can be a great way to help pollinators. You know, most pollinators are insects as we've already talked about. So try not to spray pesticides, whether they're insecticides that might kill the pollinators directly, or herbicides, which will kill a lot of the plants that they need. So try to avoid that, go organic in your gardening. And next slide. And I'll, these are my last two slides here. It really boils down to, if you wanna help pollinators, make a beautiful garden, plant lots of blooming plants, stuff that blooms spring, summer, and fall, depending where you live, maybe even in the winter. Um, and plant native plants as much as you can and don't spray pesticides, and you're gonna help the pollinators. And when you do that, not only are you going to help the pollinators, but you're going to make an awesome place for you to go outside literally every single day and explore nature. And that landscape, those landscapes that you were just looking at are just great examples of what your own backyard or your own neighborhood could look like. And I think that would be a much more fun and cool place to explore and look for some of these pollinators than just a plain old lawn. So encourage your parents to plant all of these great gardens. If you're a grown up watching, Again, lots of great resources out there from the National Wildlife Federation on how to do everything we just talked about, about helping pollinators. So I'm gonna stop there because we're almost out of time. We wanna get to questions. We gotta take a picture. So I'm gonna turn it back to you, Brian. Hey, thank you so much. Just such great information and enthusiasm. I, I've never met anyone who loves bees as much as you do <laughs> until I probably see all these kids in their Instagram photos out there who now are our bee lovers. So with that said, that's our segue. Get those cameras ready. We're going to give everybody an opportunity in a second to lean into the screen, get a, a, a pollinator selfie with, uh, with Dave. We'll make sure we can CGI in some pollinators somehow or another. Um, so get those cameras ready. If you upload that to Instagram and tag the National Wildlife Federation and Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win a copy of the book that David mentioned about attracting these kinds of pollinators to your backyard. Uh, I'll be able to, to hold that up there for just a second. And, um, and then there we go. Get in front of you and we'll get, we'll, uh, we'll beat the, um, yeah. We'll <laughs> Zoom back. I can't do it. I was able it's to a do high it. tech book is, uh, is all we're saying here. Right. So get those cameras out and you'll be entered to win a winner spot in uh wildlife creature camp with varsity tutors this summer. With all that said, let me turn it back uh, full screen to you, David, so everybody can get those pictures. All right. So yeah, everybody, I want you to gather in, get ready to get your picture. And I think on the count of three, I want everybody to say pollinator. One, two, three. Pollinator. Okay, how about we say, why don't you shout out the name of your favorite pollinator of all the ones we talked about today? And I know what mine is. So I'm gonna say one, two, three, bees. All right, let's say, um, how about say butterfly? <laughs> And again, if you guys take your pictures and post them to Instagram and tag National Wildlife and you tag Varsity Tutors, some of, one of you, or, or I think it's one, maybe is it just one who's going to win a copy of the book? One winner, um, but 
anyone who clicks the link on their screen to learn more about wildlife creature camp can, uh, can join wildlife creature camp. So we're really all winners out here, except I will say that the biggest winners, who else was yelling hummingbird with me? Hummingbirds are so cool. So <laughs> bees are, are also amazing butterflies. There's all kinds of amazing pollinators out there. Um, and so that brings me to questions. Though. So keep your questions coming, guys. We're a little over time, but we'll get to at least a few of them answered. Uh, one of my favorite questions, David, was uh, you had to know this was coming in, uh, in 2021. Are cicadas pollinators? Ah, great question. No, cicadas are not pollinators. Um, the cicadas themselves are awesome. And maybe Brian, at some point you can have me back and I'll do an entire class just on cicadas. Um, we did have the, 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 the brood 10 or brood X cicadas emerge in many parts of the Eastern US. Really, really cool animals. They're not pollinators. They're members of the bug family, as I mentioned earlier. They have sucking mouth parts, but they don't suck flower nectar. They suck sap out of the, the, the roots when they're underground as nymphs and then out of the branches when they're adults. So good question. I'm, I'm going to send you a calendar invite for 17 years from now, same time, <laughs> same place. And uh, we'll get after it with cicadas. Although they're interesting all the time. They're only here every 17. That's right. Years. And there are annual species that come out every year. So Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, we do need to, we need a class on this. Everybody's waiting their 17 years. I had no idea we could wait. It's like the black and yellow bees thing all over again. Uh, yeah. Hey, one other big question. The most common question people had was they've been planting flowers and plants in, the, in their backyards, uh, but have had them overrun some by deer, some by weevils, some by beetles. Um, what can you tell us about, but we, we don't want to use pesticides. What can you tell us about planting the kinds of plants and flowers that will attract pollinators, uh, but won't get devoured by these other animals that may make a mess of our gardens as well? Yeah, that's a really, really great question. Um, and again, I write a lot about this in my book and the National Wildlife Federation and our Garden for Wildlife program has lots of different information. Short answer is just plant a lot. The more you plant, the more there will be to go around and that won't get eaten. You know, deer, they can be, you know, really, really greedy and they can devour a lot of different things. But, you know, if you just plant two or three flowers and the deer come, that's it, right? So try to devote as much space as possible in your yard, in your garden, you know, even if you live in the city, maybe you don't have your own backyard, there's community gardens that you can get involved in, planting lots of these wonderful blooming plants. Um, you can sometimes get into some sprays that are all natural that make the plant taste bad if you really, really are desperate. And I'll, and I'll tell you the truth, I'm dealing with that right now. I just planted a pollinator garden in my new backyard and we have a lot of rabbits here. And as these little plants are getting established, the rabbits are coming in and eating them. And so I, I've been putting a little bit of deterrent spray that's all natural. So it's not gonna hurt anything. It just makes the plant taste bad, just at least until the plants get established so they can kind of be a little bit more robust and kind of survive getting chewed on by all these darn rabbits. But uh, you know, the rabbits need to eat too, I guess. Yeah, I think that's an important point that uh, the, the fact that these animals get into, you know, people's backyards and, and community gardens and things to eat these just proves that we need to plant more because there's there's not enough food out there. And so yeah. it's not just for pollinators. It's for all the other animals. If you care about wildlife, plant. That's right. And one, one other tip on that is plant milkweed, because, again, the milkweed tastes bad. It has toxins in the leaves and almost nothing will eat it. So the rabbits are not touching any of my milkweed. And I just saw a female monarch butterfly laying eggs in the milkweed in my yard. And no one's going to eat that milkweed other than those, those monarch caterpillars. And in the meantime, the bees are visiting the flowers. So that's a tip too. Like plant things that the, the deer and the rabbits don't like to eat. And if you choose wisely, you'll, you'll also be offering pollinator habitat. Yeah, that's great. And just to confirm, I think milkweed is, it has to as like native species in different places. So make Absolutely. Sure There's like 90 plus different species of milkweed yeah. native to North America. Every single region has a milkweed species that's cultivated that you can buy at the garden center. In the East, I would recommend swamp milkweed. Not a really great name, but it's beautiful and it does really well in most gardens. There's butterfly milkweed. There's common milkweed. That one's a little bit weedy. But, um, you know, we, we call it milkweed. It's got a little bit of a PR problem because people don't want to plant weeds. But most of these are beautiful. They're ornamental. They do really well in gardens. And they're really, really important. If you're out west, showy milkweed, California milkweed. If you're down in Texas, antelope horns milkweed. There's purple milkweed. There's, green, there's a whole bunch of them. Again, I can do a whole class just on milkweeds or monarchs. So, you know, you'll, again, I'm, I'm offering to do that if you, if you have me back. <laughs> Come back soon. That's perfect. Yeah, look up your native milkweed, plant that. Um, it, it, it's, 
it's marketing problems also because it tastes bad, but, uh, but it's definitely important. So thanks for that. Um, hey, last one for you. This one, I love that you know, the people were asking this way was, all right, we know that somewhere around the time of the dinosaurs, uh, these flowering plants tricked insects into doing their work for them so that they could you know, be pollinated and reproduce. Before that, kind of tipping point and, and uh, breakthrough, you know, how it was kind of a genre of questions here. How, how are they reproducing before they had that, that tipping point or, or and all that? How, if, if plants don't, like you said, have brains, how did they figure this out? Um, how did we get to here? Or, you know, is this a, like a one in a million, like we can't believe it happened or kind of how did this all come to be? Because it is so fascinating. Well, that's a doozy of a last question because that is, you know, we're talking about, you know, thousands and millions of years of evolution happening. Um, so the, again, the very, very, very simple answer is some of them were wind pollinated. Some of them um, kind of reproduced by spores so they don't have to move the pollen uh, from one place to the next. Ferns, for example, that we still have today, you know, the fern group of plants was much more dominant back before flowering plants emerged. And so uh, it was just a different way of reproducing that maybe wasn't quite as, um, uh, I don't want to say effective, but it's just a different way of being. And, you know, that's how mother nature works, right? Sometimes things just happen at random and then they start working and then they kind of build on each other and things co-evolve together, you know, and we get this tremendous diversity and complexity in the natural world. And that's what we try to protect, you know, as wildlife conservationists. That's what the National Wildlife Federation is all about. That's what, why I do these talks, because I'm hoping everybody out there not only learned something and had a little bit of fun, but I'm hoping you want to get out there and help me and help the National Wildlife Federation help save some of these animals and save their habitats so that we can have a world where we can have all those delicious foods and we can go out and see these awesome, really cool insects and that we can be happy and healthy too. We're all connected, all life on this planet. And it's up to us to make sure that uh, that, that continues. So. Nice. Thank you. Whether it was, uh, you know, a, a cosmic accident or, uh, you know, whatever it was, we are very fortunate to be in a world where the flowers we love to see and smell, the food we love to eat, you know, all the, the nature around us all works together in harmony and it's up to us to, uh, to preserve that harmony. So amazing message. Thanks so much, David. Thanks to all of you for your questions. We're really excited to get and see, uh, see your pictures. Uh, we do, as promised, have a, 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 a photo of David's book since it's, uh, it's a little, um, Zoom doesn't love holding books up in front of you. I put you on the spot there a little bit with that. So here's, uh, as promised, the instructions for who to tag to uh, to be able to win. If you want to know more about David's book, it's up there on the screen so you can check it out, um, kind of available wherever you uh, you get your books. And if you want to learn more about Wildlife Creature Camp, there's a link on your screen to be able to learn a little bit more. One person will win with their Instagram photo, but you're all welcome to uh, explore nature that much more with Varsity Tutors this summer. So thanks to David for some amazing information, a whole lot of fun, and uh, helping us rethink bees in a way that uh, I think we all kind of needed. Thanks to all of you for all of your participation and questions and we'll see everybody back here soon.